Awesome. Thank you. All right. The book of Daniel, chapter 2. It's really long, so get comfortable. Daniel interprets the dream. Verse 24. Then Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon. Daniel said to them, don't kill the wise men. Take me to the king, and I'll tell him the meaning of this dream. Ariok quickly took Daniel to the king and said, I have found one of the captives from Judah who would tell the king the meaning of his dream. The king said to Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, Is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Thank you. Daniel replied, There are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret, but... There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And yes, yes. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what would happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. While your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about the coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what's going to happen. And it is not because I'm wiser than anyone else, but I know the secret of your dream. But because... God wants you to understand what is in your heart. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron. And its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain but not by human hands. It struck the feet of the iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. That was the dream. Now we'll tell the king what it means. Your Majesty, you are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours would rise to take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom, represented by bronze, would rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there would be a fourth one, as strong as iron. That kingdom would smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay, showing that this kingdom will be divided. Like iron mixed with clay, it would have some strength of iron, but while some parts of it would be as strong as iron, other parts would be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms would try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage, but they wouldn't hold together just as iron and clay don't mix. During the reigns of, these king, of those kings, the Lord of heaven would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed or conquered. It would crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it would stand forever. This is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands that crushed to pieces at the statue of iron, bronze, silver, gold, and clay. The great God was showing the king what would happen in the future. The dream is true and its meaning is certain. Then King Nebuchadnezzar threw himself down before Daniel and worshiped him. And he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before him. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> The king said to Daniel, truly, your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, the revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Then the Lord appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. 
He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as chief over his wise men. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon, while Daniel remained in the king's court. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, Fuente, for reading that Bible reading. Let's go ahead and celebrate, uh, Fuente, for uh, that. Um, please have your seats. Um, uh, I want you to just say a brief hello to somebody who's sitting next to you. Tell them welcome to uh, this worship gathering. Tell them they look nice. Uh, we are in um, a Faith and Work series this month. As we know, um, in the month of September, particularly Labor Day, is a time where the country gathers together and honors and celebrate American workers, particularly in view of their contributions uh, socially and economically uh, to the country. Um, and so this month, in light of the season, we have been asking ourselves this question, what does it look like to be a kingdom disciple at work in a secular world? What does it look like to be a kingdom disciple at work in a secular world? And so for that purpose, will be in the book of Daniel this month. And Daniel and the book of Esther uh, are what we consider in the Bible exilic literature. In other words, this is a time and space in the narrative of the Israelites where they've been exiled to the country of Babylon. And so all of the narratives we see in Daniel, all the narratives we see in Esther and some other books of the Old Testament, including Jeremiah and Habakkuk, are all narratives of what happened when the children of God, children of God, people of Israel, were taken as captives and exiled into Babylon. And the reason why that's important for us in this modern day era is because here you see the people of Israel who all of their lives, as it were, they had served a monotheistic God. They believed in one God. They had their own kingdom values and convictions. But here they've been captured and transported to another country where the values and the systems are completely different, where they mo worship multiple gods. They're polytheistic. They do not believe in the God of Israel. And um, as you can see, even as Fonte was reading, despite everything that King Nebuchadnezzar saw, he still doesn't get it at the end. He sees uh, the magicians and the astrologers and all these wise men unable to answer the dream, but Daniel can, and then he begins to worship him. He still doesn't get it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that component next weekend. But for this weekend, we want to look into this king's dream and how the people of Israel, particularly Daniel, Hananiah, Mezariah, and Azariah, also known as Meshach, uh, and Abednego were here in um, Babylon. But before we go into the text um, for this morning, let's, let's just share a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we are grateful that we get the privilege to gather as your children, uh, to worship you and to dwell together in unity. Uh, Father, we ask by the help of your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us. Let it be clear to us by the word that we received this morning what it looks like to be a kingdom disciple at work in a secular world. And in so doing, may we bring you glory through our work. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and amen. And everyone said amen. amen. Last week, to contemporize and to contextualize this particular narrative and text, I asked the question, that what would it look like if we, professionals and intellectuals and workers, were transported to another country to go work there for a foreign country, what is also maybe even an, an, an enemy country? Just this week, my parents called me, and I guess they were having some sort of debate uh, between each other as to what happened in 2001. And so my mom and my dad were arguing about where they were, whether they're in the United States or whether they're in Nigeria, and they were asking this question, where were we in September 11 of 2001? And I said, we were here, and you guys were in Nigeria when that happened. And I said, listen, the truth of the matter is that most of us, particularly if you were born in the 80s, maybe if you were born in the 90s, know exactly what you were doing when 9-11 happened. Can I get a witness on that? Almost 
everyone, it was like time flows when we were watching uh, the screens and we saw airplanes flying into the Twin Towers. It was like we in our lifetime never would have thought that America could ever be under such a terrorist attack. But for a moment, can you imagine if this enemy organization, this terrorist organization by the name of Al-Qaeda had not only flown into the White House and demolished it, they took and they captured 10,000 people. And they took the military leaders. They took the professional class. They took the temple workers and they captured 10,000 of them and took them back to Afghanistan. That's exactly what happened in this context. And then the prophet Jeremiah will begin to speak to them in Jeremiah chapter 28 and Jeremiah chapter 29 that here you are in exile, Israelites. Your purpose and your role there is to settle down, is to get married, is to build homes in Afghanistan. In matter of fact, work there and pray for that city and that country of Afghanistan. The country that just captured you, that just decimated your nation, we want you to begin to work for us now. You do not believe what they believe. You do not believe in their gods. You do not have the same cultural values. All of your freedoms, so to speak, are gone. This is what it looked like for Daniel and his three Hebrew friends to work in a city that was not their home. Likewise for us, the Bible tells us as believers that because we are from a different kingdom, a different origin, we have been saved by grace, we've been ushered into his kingdom, and yet we live in this world, the Bible tells us that we are in exile here in this world, that this world as we know it is not our permanent home. We are, as it were, resident aliens. That sounds familiar to many people who have immigrant history with resident aliens. In other words, we, we live and work in this country, but we're not originally from this country. The Bible says, as believers, we are, and we now have a different origin, a different home, a different kingdom, but yet we work and live in this world that has values that are different from ours. So in the year 605 BC, this is what happened. King Nebuchadnezzar goes into the Judah and captures these intellectuals, these professional classes, and he takes them to Babylon. That's the context in which we're in. And the plan and the purpose for Nebuchadnezzar was clear, that when he took these people to Babylon, he didn't want them to remember who their God was. He didn't want them to remember what their kingdom values were. He didn't want them to, 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 to remember who and what their values and their convictions were. No, his plan, if I can use this word, was to Babylonize them. You know, uh, when we come to this country, for those of us who are first or second generation immigrants, sometimes your parents will complain that you've become Americanized. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar's plan all along was to Babylonize these people. He wanted them to forget who their God was. And that's why when we look into Daniel chapter 1, he begins to feed them the king's food from the king's table so that they would no longer adhere to the kosher or the Jewish diet. Of course, as we read last week, they withstood that. They said they were not going to lean into the king's diet and they were able to stand and hold on to their convictions and yet work with compassion and competence in what they were given. And so they held on to their royal heritage as kingdom citizens, right? But Nebuchadnezzar's plan still was to Babylonize them. And now, let me read this. I didn't read this last week. But Daniel 1 and chapter 5 and 6, it began to tell us to the extent that Nebuchadnezzar was going to cause or try to force Daniel and his friends to forget their convictions. So much so that he went and he changed their names. He changed their names. Does this sound familiar? Captive being taken from another land and to get them to forget their heritage, they begin to indoctrinate them with another culture and change their names. Oh, this has happened in our own recent history without going into detail. But here we see in Daniel chapter 1, verse 6, Daniel, whose name meant God is my judge, 
His name was changed to Belteshazzar, Bel- Belteshazzar which means Bel, which is the Babylonian God, protect his life. Hananiah, which means the Lord is my grace or the Lord is gracious to me, was changed to Shadrach, which means the command of Aku, another Babylonian god. Michelle, whose name is who is like unto our God. Some even might even call it the version of Micah. Michelle, who is like unto our God, was changed to Meshach, who is like Aku. Azariah, God has helped me to Abednego, the servant of Nebo. You see all the different gods in their city, the different gods in their country, whereas these are people who have a heritage of God God values and, and, and God heritage and godly principles. They are intentional about changing their name so they can change their identity to something totally different. This is what it looks like then to live in a culture like ours, You see, the Babylonian Empire had no problem with you worshiping multiple gods like Aku and Nebo and and, and, and Bel. What they had a problem with, as you will see again in Daniel chapter 3 next weekend, is that they had a problem with you saying there was only one and true only God. And that's the one God we will serve. They had no problem with you saying that you have many gods. And so while we in our context may not necessarily have gods like Aku and Nebo and, 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 uh, and Bel, we have other gods in our cities. We have the god of beauty, where we look to our beauty to give us a sense of worth and significance. We have the god of money, where we say the more money I have, the more significant I have. We have the god of power. The more power I have, then truly, truly I'm someone. We have the god of sex and sexuality. The more people I sleep with, the more people I have encounter with, the more worthy I am as a man or a woman. We have the God of love. If I'm in a relationship and I have somebody who loves me, then I'm truly, truly worthy. If I don't, then I mean nothing. In even our work, we have the God of work. That we continue to work and work and work to overwork and to, to the exclusion of rest because we want to tell ourselves, if I can arrive at this position at work, if I can make this X number of dollars, then truly, truly I will know that I am someone. Oh yeah, we have our own God. They may not be called our Ku and Nebo. But we, in a culture that celebrates and gives us the idea that this is what success looks like, we abandon and we choose not to spend time with the one and true God and we chase other gods. And this precisely is the reason why Israel was in exile to begin with. Because God had called the people of Israel. He had chosen them. He had called them by grace, not because they were strong or not because they were great, but he put his mark upon them and he brought them into his royal family. And the God of Israel told them, my calling upon your life is to be similar to the call I gave to Adam and Eve in the garden, that you will be my representatives here on earth, that you will work not for your glory, you'll work for my glory, that in your work you will cultivate the earth, you will make the world a beautiful place in response to the love I have for you. You are my co-regents, Israel, the one who I've called to be my representative, to be the ones who begin to work in this world, to bring beauty into broken spaces and to bring light into darkness. That's my call upon your life. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, before God began to give Israel these Ten Commandments and begin them the convictions and the constitutional law, if you will, known as the Ten Commandments, he says this to them. Exodus 19, by 6, he says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you should speak to the children of Israel. He's speaking to Moses. He said, you are a kingdom of peace. You are royalty. You come from a royal heritage and family because I, being the king of kings, have made you and you are ought to represent me here on earth. And be my priests, be the ones who intercede and work in this world to make something beautiful of it. What does Israel do? They chase after other gods, and God warned them over and over again. If you chase after other gods, you will become slave to these gods. And that's exactly what happened. And that's the reason why they're in Babylon. They're in Babylon because they failed to heed the warnings of the prophets. And here we see ourselves now, like I mentioned earlier, in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, again, most of us know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but those were the Babylonian names. The real names were Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
And here they are in Daniel chapter 1, they say, you know what? We are going to stay true to our convictions. We will not cave in or capitulate to the gods of this world as it were. And so while in Daniel chapter 1, we see how they stand against the Babylonian indoctrination, in Daniel chapter 2 then, we see what they do. On one end, too many times, Christians are known for what they're against. But unfortunately, we don't see enough about believers where they begin to show forth what they are for. And now, these ind individuals in this context now begin to show exactly how we as believers begin to work, begin to live in a world that doesn't necessarily believe what we believe. Do they abandon the work? Absolutely not. Do they assimilate to the work? Absolutely not either but rather they engage. They engage with their distinct principles and conviction, but yet in a way that's different from everybody else. They engage knowing fully well that they have their own cultural values, their own ideas, and their own kingdom principles, but they still begin to work in the system, work for the glory of God, interceding for the betterment of mankind and flourishing of others. And so they're not isolating themselves from culture, but on the other hand, they're not assimilating the culture either. They're engaging the culture with the gospel of the kingdom and the values for the glory of God. Can I get an amen? So how do they work? They worked as royal priests, and I'll show you how. Because a really, really brief recap, we didn't read the whole of Daniel chapter 2 because it's 49 verses. But really briefly, the king Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. His dream is um, a dream that is crazy where they, 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 he, he dreams a dream and then he tells the people who are around them to tell him what he dreamt. I mean, this is crazy. Anybody else here have a boss who is just impossible to work with? Like he's just unreasonable. At least when Joseph was called to interpret a dream, they told Joseph what the dream was. And then he goes and he interprets the dream for Pharaoh at the time in the, book of, in the book of Genesis. In this context, Nebuchadnezzar said, I had a dream. You tell me what I dreamed about. Uh, crazy. And then he says, not only are you to tell me what I dreamt about, I want you to interpret what I dreamt, uh, interpret the dream. And then if you don't tell me what I dreamed of, you and your household are doomed. Your whole household is done. I'm killing all of y'all. Anybody here who have this impossible fellowship director to work with? <laughs> like just draconian decrees. It doesn't make any sense. But yet, this is what you're, this is the hand you're dealt with. What does Daniel and his friends do? What does Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle and Azariah do, the Bible says, they go into their secret place. They call his friends and let's pray. Let's begin to intercede. This draconian decree is unfair and is unreasonable. But we're not going to engage back and forth with this king. We're not going to go tooth for tooth. We're not going to call him names. We're not going to be obnoxious and rude about it. Oh, there is a God in heaven. Oh, there's a king of kings who's above you. You may be the greatest king on earth, but there's a God in heaven. And that's what we ought to do. That there we may find ourselves working in systems that are unfair, that are impossible, that we say, oh, well, you may be impossible, but I have a God in heaven who is the God of all possibilities. This problem may seem insurmountable, but I have a God in heaven who is omniscient, who knows and sees everything, and I will begin to engage and intercede, not you directly, but the one who is above you. That's the first step. The first step is not argument. The first step is not contention. The first step is prayer. That we, we depend on him in prayer to engage the systems of our world that may seem unfair, that may seem impossible, and may seem draconian. And we begin to ask God, what do I do here? That's who God has called us to be. We are a royal priesthood. Can I get an amen? amen. And so they begin to work as royal priests. On one end, they are from the royal family, but on the other hand, they are priests 
praying for their situation, their circumstance. On one hand, they know who they are and their kingdom principles and value, but on the other hand, they still remain engaged in the place, not necessarily abdicating their roles, but they stay there to begin to pray, to seek God for wisdom to engage in this particular tropical situation. That's exactly what happens. And so what by their prayer and the praise of these priesthood of believers in this particular situation, God gives them wisdom. And Daniel, in true fashion, begins to give credit and all the glory to God for the wisdom he just received in this complex situation. Friends, you will go through complex situations at work. Because we live and we work in a broken world, you will have horrible bosses. I know I've had some. I've had some bosses at work where people will come to me and say, Dio, what did you do to offend this person? I'm, I'm, I, they, they've done some things to me, particularly on my journey to becoming a partner at work. There are things that I had to do and that I felt were unfair and people will come to me and say, nobody else had to do what you're doing. What did you do to offend this individual? Oh, we're going to have some troublesome situations. We're going to have some difficult times. But what do we do? We don't go back and forth with these individuals. No, we step up above them and we take it to the Lord in prayer. And that's exactly what Daniel does. And in so doing, God gives him the revelation for what he was going to do. As we will see, Daniel will receive the revelation, but let's just go really quickly and talk about what the dream was. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had been nursing all along, and we'll see this in Daniel chapter 3 next weekend, to build a great statue that was going to reflect who he was. He, you see, God had called us to be his image bearers, but Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to worship the true God. He wanted to be the image, and he wanted everyone to worship him. He had a God complex, if you will, like many of our bosses or many of the people who we work with. There was a sense where he wanted to be worshipped. And so as a result of that, he had this nightmare, and there's this great statue, of course, where he has and sees his head in gold, and everything else begins to show. And you can show that statue on the screen. Nebuchadnezzar had nursed a dream to build a statue that was of Statue of Liberty proportions, where everyone could see him and say, ah, that's the king. He is God. The gold statue was to represent his head, the chest of arms and silver, stomach, stomach and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet partially of iron and clay. But in that dream, that statue was broken down by a rock. And all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar knows this dream and he has a nightmare. It's bringing him nightmares at home. The Daniel begins to tell him, which has, again, end of the world, you know, what they call eschatological, you know, implication. We're talking about the future events of this world. And I'm going to skip Daniel chapter 4 to 7, or rather 4, to four and 5, because, again, that has more prophecies for the end times. And latter half of Daniel also has prophecies for the end times. But in this particular context, Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar what's going to happen to him. There's a Babylonian empire, which is the head of gold. After a few years... Bible was clear that in the future event, Daniel had prophesied that the Medo-Persian Empire was going to come and take over uh, Babylon. And after that, there was another kingdom that was going to come, the kingdom of Greece. They were going to come over and take over this kingdom. And then lastly, this fourth kingdom was the Roman Empire. So here we see the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire, which actually happened. Just as Daniel predicted, in history we see all these empires will come and they will rise and go. All these kings thinking that they're God, all these empires thinking that they're going to have the biggest kingdom. They will come, they will succeed for a little bit, but after a short while another kingdom comes and takes over. And there was a rock that came and knocked the whole entire system down. And that rock, the Bible says, became a mountain. And all that mountain now began to fill the entire earth. Does anybody remember the scripture that says that the glory of God will cover the earth as the water covers the seas? Oh, that's what's going to happen at the end of the world. That the kingdom of God, that all the empires that may come and go, regardless of who reigns and who rules, in the end, 
It's the kingdom of God that will sustain that Jesus is coming back, that despite all these different empires, despite all the warring factions, people will come, people will go. Empires will rise, people, empires would fall. People are predicting what's going to be the next empire after the, the U.S. Is it going to be China? Is it going to be India? Is it going to be Africa? Who knows? But the bottom line is, in the end, all that is done will still fail because the only kingdom that will last is the kingdom of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. That means then that any kingdom that you work for is only temporary. It is only when we are plugged in and engaged in and the building and the advancing of the kingdom of God that will always remain eternal. And so the question then becomes, whose kingdom are you going to build? What kingdom are you going to align yourself with because here's the, here's the cross and here's the practical implication for it. Because while I just shared the end time implication, here's the modern practical implication for what I just shared. The reason why Nebuchadnezzar is anxious, the reason why he's having nightmares, the reason why he can't sleep at night, because he wants to build his own empire. He's advancing his own kingdom and what he just saw was a revelation that his kingdom was going to fall anyway. Here's the practical question for you and I. Whose kingdom are you building? Are you building yours? Here's how you know what kingdom you're building. Here's how you know the true God you're serving. What keeps you up at night? What truly gives you nightmares at night? When things are not going well with something, does it keep you up at night? This is not to say where you have a situation where there's a loved one or that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where you're, you're, the stock market just crashed and you can't sleep. Oh, you're building your own financial kingdom. Things are not going well at work and, and you're having nightmares about it. Oh, you're, you're building your kingdom. You're getting older and all of a sudden you realize you're not as useful as you used to look. Oh, you have an idol of beauty and you think that the more and the older you get, you can't sleep. You, you, the idea of getting older just gives you nightmares. Whose kingdom are you building? I, I'll tell you this, and I, I've shared this many, many times. For those who are my personal friends that know this, even what I mentioned earlier about my work situation, the truth of the matter is this. The reason why I did whatever they asked me to do at work is because I had made just an idol of this idea called work. I, I said to myself, if I can just become this great partner, then truly, truly I'll know that my life has been made. Then I will know that my life is significant. Then I will know that I, I have, I've, I've achieved this great thing and I did whatever it took. I worked whatever hours it took. I did whatever craziness, whatever craziness they put me through, I bore it. Oh, because I wanted to become a partner. Oh, I, I was going to do it. And then, here's what happened. This is where I knew that something was wrong. Every time I had a medical mistake or an error, I could not sleep. I was super anxious. Ah, oh, I've made a mistake. I guess my partnership is over. I just had a wet tap. I, 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 I pushed that needle a little bit too far. Oh, my, my partnership is done now. And you know what happens when you make mistakes in the medical field and probably any other field? If you are so bent on ensuring that you are looking like the perfect physician, perfect, I'm using medicine today because we have something coming up in about medicine, then what you're going to be careful to do is you're going to probably work to overwork to the exclusion of rest. You won't be able to take vacations. When you make a mistake, you're more than likely to cover it up. You're going to cover it up because you don't want anybody to see it. And you will just be anxious all the time. And then, <laughs> I was talking to somebody about this just on Friday. You begin envious and jealous of everybody else who's going above you. I've been in this company for so long. How come he's getting a promotion I'm not? And you get mad, mad, mad when somebody else does it and you don't. How is it? that I've been in this academic institution and I've been here and I'm still an assistant professor and this person made professor and I've been here all this time. What did this person done? And you just get anxious and, 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 and nervous and competitive. Why? 
Look at Nebuchadnezzar getting all crazy and draconian because his empire, he feels, is crumbling. Likewise, when we feel our empire is crumbling at work, we lose it. Whose kingdom are you building? Are you working for your glory and for your advancement, or are you working for God's? And you say, well, how does this practically make sense? When we work for the kingdom of God's advancement, what you do, then you work into a space, and all you really, 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 truly are about is that this industry moves forward, that, that you're about taking care of people, whether it's your students, whether it's your clients, whether it's your patients, that you just care about their well-being. You're not in it necessarily for your personal advancement, even though your personal advancement is a good thing, and it comes with good work. But that's not your primary goal. That you work to bring beauty into brokenness. You work to alleviate pain. You work to add to the field in which you've been called to. You do your research, not necessarily because you want to put your name at the first author. And I've, <laughs> I've been through that too, where I was the one who did all this work in a research study when I was in residency. And then someone else came because he was so bent on becoming a fellow in this field. He went and he pushed to make him, himself the first author. He wanted to be first author so bad, even though he did no work on it. And I let him have it because I didn't care much for about this whole process like he did. But when we are so bent on becoming advanced in our fields, we will cut all kinds of corners. Why? Why? Because you don't think you're dazzling enough yet. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to build a tower so big so he can tell himself how dazzling he was. The reason why we work to overwork to the exclusion of rest, the reason why we make idols of our work because we still think that we need to work to be approved. We want to be proved of. We want to be loved on. We want to be told how good we are. We want to be told how dazzling we are. Why? Because we do not believe that in Christ we are already proved that in Christ we're already loved, and in Christ we're already dazzling to him. We don't think it, we don't believe it yet. And so we work and we work and we make idols of our work to the extent where we lose our peace and our sleep. Whose kingdom are you building? Whose glory are you working for? The Bible is clear. It's that when we join God in his mission to advance his kingdom goals and his kingdom agenda by, and this is not church work, is, is, is that when you are in your respective fields, you're doing good work there, that you're building people, that you're advancing your study, you're advancing your discipline, you're taking care of people, you're loving on people. See how Daniel begins to interpret dreams and give wisdom to the king so that he can know exactly what's going to happen in the future. Not to his glory, but to God's glory. But guess what happens? In the end, in the end, Nebuchadnezzar sees what he's done and he begins to worship Daniel. He still, Nebuchadnezzar, still doesn't get it. And we'll see again in Daniel chapter 3 how badly he doesn't get it. But if you will read ahead of time, next week we'll talk a little bit more about this. He doesn't get it still. But here's what happens. Daniel is promoted and in view of his promotion, guess what he does? He begins to beseech Nebuchadnezzar to not only have him promoted, he says, I want all of my three friends promoted too. Yes. This is what it looks like to be the royal priesthood when it's just not about your glory. Yes. It's not about your advancement. It's that you work for God's agenda and in your, God seeing you work for his agenda, he begins to lift you up at his own time without you forcing, <laughs> forcing it. Listen. In this particular work that I was doing, I, I eventually did make partner. But it came at a point where I said, listen, I will not kill myself. I can't kill myself on this thing. If I make partner, I make partner to God with the glory. If I don't, I don't. And then when the pressure was gone, I actually did better work. I did better work when it came to taking care of people. I did better work. And then <laughs> my friends who are here in the audience, who are my, even my colleagues would tell you, what would happen in my career in three years, not only did I make partner, I was promoted to not just being a site chief of multiple hospitals, but being on a board. I've, I've never, I did not advocate for it. I did not pray for it. I didn't even want it because I knew it came with more responsibility and more work, but it happened anyway. And even when I got to the board of this same said company, 
people were excited to have me there because, again, I was representing a people group that wasn't there in the room. I didn't ask for this thing, but God lifted me there anyway. I mean, I since resigned from the board like a couple of years, that many years here, because it was too much work. But in any case, it happened. It happened. And in me doing so, my word, God gave me so many opportunities to help so many people. I pray for you this morning that may God give you the wisdom to excel and the favor to excel in your work. And may he also do that in a way that by you providing solutions in your space, whether draconian or not, that in his own time and his own divine sovereignty will lift you up in places of promotion. And after he's done that, that you will lift people alongside with you. May that be your testimony in Jesus' name. Amen. And when we do so, when we do so, we point to a king who left his home and was exiled for our cause. And he was crucified and nailed on our behalf, not for his glory, but for ours. The Bible says that Jesus, who was the son of the most high God, submitted himself to being a slave. He became a slave for us so that you and I, who were slave to sin, who were slave to our work, who were slave to all other kinds of idols, could be redeemed and brought in and now be called the sons and daughters of the most high God. We were made to be with God and to work in this world as royal priests bearing his image. And it's when we live in Christ and work at the priest kings that we were always meant to be, that we experience flourishing for ourselves and we contribute then to the flourishing of others. Where do we get the power for this? As we always ask, by looking to Jesus, the true king of all kings. He is the ultimate royal high priest. Not only was he the high priest, he made himself the sacrifice so that you and I, who were once strangers, can now be called in and now be called a holy nation, a chosen generation, and a royal priesthood who will go out proclaiming the goodness of God in every sphere of influence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you because you are our high priest. You laid yourself down on the cross and you became the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone that everyone and all the builders rejected. And you've called us to be your living stones through which we will mediate your rule and your presence in all all the earth. May we see what you've done. May we know that you are the rock in which we stand, the true rock, the eternal rock of ages. And may we see that, may we stand in that. May we gain the confidence to know that we are approved and loved by you, that in Christ we are already dazzling. We don't need to work for it anymore because you finished the work on the cross on our behalf. May we see what you've done, Father, in Christ. And may we be blessed to go out into every fear of influence to be the royal priest you've called us to be. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, we have prayed. And amen. If you be blessed, but let's go ahead and celebrate God really quickly. In a few moments, we're going to take a few moments of, of prayer at the worship team, worship team leads us. Can you stand to your feet? Two prayer points. Two prayer points at the worship team leads us in the next few minutes. If you're here, you're saying, I don't even know what it looks like to be part of this royal family. I don't know what it looks like to be called a child of God. And you're saying, I want someone to pray alongside me. I, I, I thought I had it, but I don't. Maybe I walked away. We want to pray with you. Come. The prayer team will join you in prayer. If you're here, you're saying, I need wisdom at work. I work and live in a system that is hard and difficult with difficult bosses. I need wisdom, I need favor to navigate this situation. For some of you, your season at work may be different and you might want to transition to another job, another career. And you're saying, I need wisdom in this. We want to pray alongside with you as well. So at the worship team leads us, 
and anchoring us on the fact that Jesus is our chief cornerstone, we want to press alongside with you on those two prayer points. Come at the team leads us in worship.